Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to the Occult Explorers. I'm your hostess, Snappy, and I'm joined as always by my co host, Dion. How's it going, Dion? Hey, hey, glad to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties, but we got everything uh, sorted out. I'm really excited for this episode. This episode has been one I've wanted to do since the very beginning, but we wanted to make sure that we gave everyone kind of context for this because this is kind of like some of the biggest, most important imagery, right? Because when we're talking about the snake mother goddess, we're talking about one of the most primordial and ancient figures, right, in mythology. And this is something that we see kind of all around the Mediterranean and Africa and even into India and China. Like the serpent is one of the most ubiquitous images. And then the mother goddess is probably the most ubiquitous image. So combining them, it's just, it's something that so many cultures do. And we're just going to begin kind of where we left off. But before we jump in, as always, we're just going to give our quick little um, preface that we're just exploring ideas here, right? We're trying to explore a variety of mythologies. We're not talking truth. We're just talking anthropology of religion and exploring. And also be wary that we're going back to the ancient past. Things are going to get violent and things are going to get uh, body fluids and sexual as always, right? <laughs> you might so, get wet going back in the in ancient times. Right? So Dion, where did we leave off last time and where are we going with the snake mother? Well, part of it was we started in a sacred grove in our first episode where we had a, a sacrifices might have taken place or different rituals um different animals we've talked about through these episodes and the snake has featured part of it uh the mother figure the goddess archetype uh and how this uh deals from egypt all the way up to colchis Kolki, georgia you know modern day armenia which used to be a scythian empire back in ancient times we have the persian empire uh, the Phoenicians. And one thing they all have in common was mother goddesses that they worshipped as part of a, a male goddess. And, you know, a male god and a mother goddess. Um, it wasn't until certain Abrahamic uh, religions banned a female consort. You know, and that was the snake mother. Because before that, they had they had a female archetype and snakes was part of her uh accoutrement let's say right you know like i always think like we can see back right the most ancient images are these venus figurines that even predate modern hominids and then like you're saying right we have all of the serpent imagery with the goddess and like in the Greek tradition, for example, just to put the, the power of the goddess in perspective, we talk often about the myth of cycles that's ever present. And the mother goddess is the only unchanging figure in all of the cycles. She institutes the cycles and affects the change. She becomes the consort of the next god who possesses the scepter. But she's always there, ever present, ever guiding in her own way, right? Oh, yeah. You know what? Uh, let's hit the first picture. We got a lot of pictures as usual. All right. And this is from last week. And I made a boo-boo because I went with the information that uh, somebody had emailed me some information because I was looking for the image. And we were talking about how that voluptuous woman on the right had her male consort on the left. Uh, no? No. That's Matea on the left. And that's her dude on the right. Interesting. Okay, and, I can kind of see it now. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and you can tell by the pointed breast of the figure on the left. Um, and in some Egyptian stelas, people are turned to the side. So sometimes the women only have one breast. Or sometimes they don't show all your body parts, you know, because you're just from a side angle profile. Right. But that's Matea looks, right there. And that's her dude on the right. It also looks like the stella has been damaged. Like it looks like the phallus of this figure could have been removed and that the breasts 
could at least one of the breasts was removed and possibly, you know, the nipple of this breast was removed, you know? And ironically, because we'll be talking about removing one breast as part of a motif at, with these warrior uh, female archetypes later. But yeah, and this was found in Marotic Egypt. We were talking about Nubian and Kush uh, Egypt this week in our previous episode. And uh, these older mother goddesses from Egypt and female pharaohs that had power, the Kandakis or Kori uh, pharaohs, the female pharaohs. And one of the, the symbolism that they had or used was a uraeus, a cobra. And you might even see it at the top. There is a wing sun disc or sometimes it's a cobra at the top. But let's go to the next picture and I'll start to break it down because we're looking for the snake mother. And so we were talking last time about the Kandakes, the Candaces. And that's one on the right. She's voluptuous wearing a robe and her headpiece. You see the cobra on top of her head. And that cobra is Uraeus, and it's a symbolic of the sun, symbolic of rebirth. It's the serpent. Um, and that picture on the left is Wajit. That's the snake goddess, Wajit, from ancient Egypt. Um, Interesting. Because we're looking into Wajit as one of the oldest archetype, archetypes of the snake mother. You know, so let's hit the next picture. The flying serpent, right? Oh, yeah. Now, this image right here of Wajit in ancient Egypt is considered the oldest image in the world showing a staff with a snake wrapped around it and someone holding that. And its connotations dealing with medicine. Where's this from? That's amazing. Ancient Egypt. And that's Wajit right there. The goddess mm -hmm. Wajit. And she's holding her staffs. And um, we talked about Lotus last time blue water lilies and they have a, a, a certain uh, psychoactive powers but when they're combined with other plants is when they really do their magic you know um, and this is watch it and all of the pharaohs a lot of the gods you'll see Osiris, you'll see Isis, half of them have a little cobra on their forehead that's true I've noticed that yeah and that, that's Wajit. And that's uh, the snake mother. And that's one of the oldest forms of the snake mother. As well as oral traditions of any culture. Pretty sure you can go to Easter Island, a, a Hawaiian Island, uh, a Navajo tribe and ask them, do you have any myths centered around an ancient mother and a snake and I'm pretty sure they'd sit you down around the campfire and it'd, it'd spend all night telling you about the snake mother. Just we're That's lucky great. that we have some of these images survived in ancient Egypt. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I'm so just saying, like, these drugs that they're probably using, which is like snake venom and lotus combined, like that would be so intense. Well, that's what they're putting in the wines of the Scorpion King. Remember, we were talking about that in the last right. episode. That's one of the, the remedies. <clears throat> and so watch it was uh, the nurse and how take care of Osiris. I mean, Horus. Right there is the Sippus of Horus. And these are these stellas that you'd have, they found all around uh, ancient Egypt that were used. They would pour libations on it, fluids, and that would help protect you from snakes. And it's based on the story when Os uh, Horus is hiding from Seth. His uncle wants to kill him and he's hiding in the marshes and watch it. He gets stung with scorpions and snakes and watch it helps protect and heal him. The snake goddess. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. The snake mother protects him and, and she also protects a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of stuff dealing with snakes in ancient Egypt. It's, it's the main symbol you put on your forehead. So yeah, let's let's hit the the next picture. And they also had arrow poisons. That's a component of these uh, snakes. And right. different authors talk about it. Different historians and authors over the years talked about it in ancient times, fighting the tribes in Egypt that they had uh, arrow poisons. And some of the arrow poisons had, were using snakes, 
and even uh, Scorpion, like the Scorpion King, they're putting Scorpion Venom, his army used it. It was part of their trademark. And they would collect the Venoms different ways. They had different uh, milking techniques for collecting the Venoms. Sometimes they just throw, throw the animal at you on <laughs> top of a catapult. Like if you're coming up the walls, they might throw scorpions over the walls. You know, or if you're on a boat, they'll catapult some snakes or scorpions onto your boat. And this is weapons of mass destruction. This is early, early biochemical warfare. Wild, right? And we were, this is up, let's say, Sudan, Kush, Nubia, where we were at last time, Upper Egypt. Because they found some of these uh, snake poisons, especially these two that they use in modern times, are in modern times are going to be used now as a spermicide. Oh, interesting. Because yeah, in a lot of our episodes, we talk about snake antidotes. These plants sometimes are psychoactive, are used um, in abortions, menstrual cycles, female issues, and they're estrogenic. So there's a lot of things in common that you could buy, you could reference, cross-reference to find these. And so in modern times, they're doing that, and they're finding that snake venoms are going to be used to cure cancer working with diabetes. In this case, this uh, snake, these plants that work with the snake venom are going to be used as spermicides. And we talked about spermicides in uh, last week's episode, how they're putting fermented acacia and honey downstairs. Right. Our crocodile with the dung. Alligator, with the alligator dung. Yeah, yeah, because of the pH. It has a certain pH. And the other one is because of the lactic acid. And right. sometimes they just have natural properties in these plants. And they get you high. Right. So that's communion with the mother, you know. Oh, for sure. And it also makes me think of just like the uh, the, the Syrian goddess. And we know like uh, from that text by Lucian that they were doing all those snake venoms and Semiramis had her her uh, all of her um, eunuchs with her, you know, and they were all worshiping Kaibali. So like this is a pretty, pretty well established kind of practice with these snake venoms and this association with the mother goddess, you know. I mean, that's a later tradition, but yeah. And you know, the name of this, uh, these herbs that they're using is called Ubain. And it's a French, it's uh, and it's French pharmaceutical companies that are uh, working with the tribes to extract it. Interesting. Like there's another one, Curar, you might have heard of. That's oh. a famous poison, yeah, that they've used in ancient times. But it turns out that these things are also medicinal. 100% medicinal, you know? So let's hit the, the next picture. Interesting. And here you go. Here's a relief from ancient Egypt of them collecting the venom. You got that pot right there. And you got a snake entwined around it. And that's all you'll see a lot of motifs like that where the snake is around the pot and putting the venom into it. And then you got your some cobras on the side. And underneath, you do see that um, lotus symbol. Right. And you'll find the lotus a lot of times with the snake. Not necessarily that it's a dope or antidote, but maybe just it's a compound to get you high. Also, I'm looking at like what appears to be rattles, but could that also be grain? Ah, you see that. <laughs> you notice that. Those don't look like normal rattles. Right? Right. Could be cactus or grain or some kind of plant there. Yeah, yeah. And it could be a, a, a fennel because they really liked fennel as part of it. That was a big Dionysian thing. And the grains, because they were working a lot with grain there. And a lot of people say that the grains, original grains, uh, Kamut is the name. Okay. Originates out of Egypt, that Kamut. And we know that the grains is where they were, you can get ergotized grains cereals get you claviceps purpurea the burning purple or saint anthony's fire which they might call which can be bio transformed through your animals right i think this one on the all on the very far right though the round one it doesn't appear to be grain like i think that one must be opium it does yeah. look like a poppy and poppies right. were part of their their medicine or mandroga which is mandrake fruits which right. we talked about in the last episode is uh raw Amon-Ra used 
the the mandrake fruits to dye the wine red, like blood red, and then poured it in the Nile River. But it's also a concoction. Blue lily, mandrake root, or mandrake fruits, and then spiced wines. And if you're ballsy enough, you might put a little of your snake venom. Wow. <laughs> Intense, eh? <laughs> and so we're talking about Wajet. That's the name of, of the snake goddess. Well, she had a, ca a capital. And it's called Per Wajet. But the Greeks called it Buta. If you want to hit the next picture. And where was this? Upper or lower Egypt? This is lower Egypt. And this is down by, by the water. Interesting. So down on the by, coast. Yeah, down by Alexandria. And um, like if you see Egypt, it looks like a lotus itself. Where, where it gets closer to the ocean. Right. And as the, the Nile branches. Yeah. Beautiful. And this is called Pharaoh's Hill. Per Wajet or Buto in ancient Greek. And this is uh, where they had the famous oracle that the Greeks would go to. They said this is where the Sibylines, uh what are the birthplaces? Right here is Pharaoh's Hill and the snake goddess, the snake mother. And this is one of the first oracles in a lot of the ancient histories. It comes from Pharaoh's Hill. Along with, um, you got Mount Amun, we talked about last episode, Cobra Mountain. And you have uh, the oasis of Siwa. That's Libya or Egypt, depending on which time frame. And that's uh, the Oracle of Amun. And they're all interconnected, these oracles. And the Ammonite priesthoods. And so, yeah, this was a capital of snake worship and snake oracles that people from around the world would go to. So interesting. Her Wajet, or it's called Buto, modern times Pharaoh's Hill, because of the pharaonic activities. You know, you, you see how things, how they took care of it. <laughs> they tore that all down. You got to know ISIL or ISIS not the goddess Isis, but the Muslim Brotherhood, they did a number on Egypt. To them, this is all this is all evil. You know, yeah, or no. Christians preserved it as a testimony to the Bible to prove, like, yeah, see here, here's Pharaoh's Hill. This is where they creep, you know, this is where they crucified them. And so they use this as evidence. So they keep it around as evidence. It's like a Disneyland tourist attraction. And that's what we said. That's why it's all still there because of the, the money it generates. For Egypt. Right. Because, you know? No, no, we know, right? Like how extremist Egypt is, right? Like it's the home of um, the M Muslim Brotherhood, right? It also has um, the largest Islamic university, right? In the world is in Egypt. And like, yeah, and it's just, uh, it, th there's an ongoing history of this. It's unfortunate of either obscuring the information or hiding the information, you know, and it's just something like that's ongoing throughout the entire Islamic world, right? Like it's not just Egypt either. They're not doing any archaeology in Saudi Arabia, for example, you know? Yeah, the Nabataean stuff, you know, which right. we will talk about. What, what little there is, is interesting and points sure. to Petra and it points to uh, Petra being part of the culture. You know, just Petra now, we just think it's that little canyon in Jordan. But uh, the moss were, were originally oriented towards there. That was the I remember you telling us that. You know. But let's hit the next picture. So here's another one of these motifs with the trifecta. You know, they do that a lot of times in, uh, and they do that in, in, in the uh, Indian stuff too. Is where they they have do a, that in the, and in the Greek, like Ammon has an entire book on this, right? On um, on gynomorphs that everyone should read. But if you look here, right, you have the feminine serpent, you have the bigendered serpent, and then you have the masculine serpent. This is a constant pagan theme. Usually when you have these triune god figures, it's not like a later interpretation was to imagine the woman in like three stages of life. But the ancients didn't see it as that. They saw it as the gender triune, you know? Right. Well, we'll go back to that one. Sure, I didn't mean to and I'll tell that. you who they are. That's, um, if you could see there, can you read what it says there at the bottom? Um, 
me just try to see here. Oh, shoot. Uh, Osiris Canopy Entre Isis A Serapis. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. That's so Serapis. Osiris Canopy and Isis and Serapis. Yeah, and Isis and Serapis as snakes. And then at the end, it says Daimones. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. For, for Daimones, right? Yeah, this is in Egypt. In Serapis, if people know, you got the Apis bull, and then you got Serapis, which is a combination. And they were doing bull worship, snake worship. It, it has some mythic elements in there. Um, there's a lot to unpack. That's for, for later, but I just wanted to throw that in just to show uh, the snakes and how they got the trifecta of the snakes. You know, another trifecta, uh, We last time I showed men, you remember the, the god that had the big Priapus? Yes, I do remember. Yes, you had the, 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 the large erect phallus. <laughs> yeah, because they have a, a trio with him, with um, Horus and Wajet. Oh, interesting. So it's Min, Horus, and Wajet, the snake mother. You know, and the thing is, I wanted to talk more about Min last time, but we couldn't. So I just want to throw in the things from this time. You know, one of his symbolic elements, like when you saw him last time, he was standing with a heart on and holding a flail. Right. So usually he has his, his penis in his hand and the flail in the other hand. And we talked about the flail in the other episodes, what that does. And let and Osiris, it. right? The blood of Osiris. He's whipping Osiris, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, hard to collect the, the incense. Yeah. Collect the incense. And, um, you know, and wild lettuce. Because wild lettuce is always there with men. Because you can stroke wild lettuce and it produces that white latex that looks like semen. That's also a uh, sedative. Right. It's Similar to opioids. Yeah. And we know that it's um, Horus tricks set to eat lettuce with his semen on it. And that's how he conquers him. Amazing. That's how Horace kicks Seth's ass is through making him eat a semen, his uncle, on the lettuce. You know, and so part of men's symbology, besides having a penis in his hand or a flail in the other hand, is sometimes he has a barbed arrow. Oh, interesting. Which is the poison arrow. Right, again. And the wild lettuce, as well as the lemonite. Have you ever oh. heard of what a belemonite is? No, no. Explain this, please. I'd never heard of a belemonite. And I'm like, what? And they, they had petrified or fossil, uh, fossilized belemonites in Mint's temple. And what that is is an ancient creature that they used to have in uh, Egypt. That looked oh? like a squid thing with a bunch of tentacles on front of its mouth and weird eyes. and So it was like a crustacean or like yeah, a mollusk? Yeah. And they had a fossilized one in the middle of the temple. They're worshiping these in the Min temples. This ancient weird oh. creature, wa weird water creatures. So it's like ammonites, like those ammonite fossils. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, and another thing, when we, if you look at the Min statue, I should have put it, but we'll, we'll look at it next time. He has a red ribbon wrapped around his head. And okay. you might see a lot of people in the Catholic Church, our Kabbal Kabbalistic homies, put the little red ribbon. Yeah, you also see that in um, India. It's a sign of nobility for the Brahmin caste. Like if you're a Brahmin, you wear that. It's like I'm, I'm a bond. A, you're, you're bound, you know? No, it's a sign of blood in men coming with the semen and blood exchange. He wore the red. He wore the red tassel first. This is the oldest use of that red tassel. And what's weird is, so he had his arms free, penis in one hand and flail in the other, but his legs are bandaged. Oh, so his arms are free, but legs are bandaged, and that deals with his uh, chthonic uh, symbolism, his, his powers. It, it's a it's, it's a weird mix, and these are the older gods. This is you get into that yeah. upper Egypt stuff. This it, makes it, me think of uh, a lot of the in imagery we see with Kronos, where Kronos is often depicted with like a limp, you know, or we'll see the same thing with uh, Shani, which is the Indian Saturn. He's usually depicted with a limp. You know, it's like uh, this is uh, often the chthonic deities are kind of wounded. Ah. Yeah. And, and another aspect of him is called Min Amun. Oh. And he's um, synchronized with Pan. And so when they had the Min festivals, 
that's when they break out the lettuces and the blue lotus and the wines and the semens and the all kinds of things. And they, they would have a week long festival. That's amazing. That was like a Dionysic older Egyptian Dionysic festival, you know, um, let's go to the next pitch. Wow. So that is an Egyptian mongoose. And on his forehead, he has that cobra again, the uraeus. Even he gets to put it. You know, everyone that has juice in ancient Egypt, you put a cobra on your forehead. You got to have the wajit, right? Yeah, yeah. And the uraeus. And, wa and the wajit being the, um, And so the thing about the mongoose, why it's the pharaoh's companion, is that it can kill snakes. Right, it hunts them out and it's protected of the poison, right? Yeah, and the way it does it is when it sees a snake, it gets all happy and it goes over and it rolls in the mud and it lets it dry and then it rolls in the mud again and it does it a few times until it builds up a, a, a coating, a mud coating around its body. And then it goes over and it does some kind of kung fu yoga moves where it just, can, it doesn't get hurt and it takes them out. And it was a game. It, it was it was a part of hunting mechanisms because it would find them for you too. Right. You see this a lot in India. Like I think there's that famous uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling story called Ricky Tikki Tavi, Ooh, which is about a magic uh, uh, mongoose who can who who goes in and protects people from cobras. You know, so like it's a, it's a, it's a pretty common theme anywhere you see mongoose, and people were always training them and using them. Oh yeah. And there were the Pharaoh's companions. Wild. Love it. Oh, yeah. So this is the next pick. Woo! All oh. right. So let's get into another snake mother in history, a real snake mother. Her name was Cleopatra. And there were seven Cleopatras because it's a title. But the most famous one, the one, you know, that gets with Mark Antony and, you know, I'm sure we've seen movies and comics and stories and you've heard of at least i know you've heard of cleopatra yeah you you know like of, of all the famous women in history she gets talked about uh the most you know to the detriment of others in some cases i find <laughs> you know she spoke eight languages that is impressive i mean she is an amazing incredible person don't get me wrong <laughs> and did write books wow do we have any did any survive or uh, I think uh, one survives and the other one survived in what's the word uh, when when authors talk about other works they quotation. survive through another yeah. author. Yeah, it survives in reference and in and in quotation. Yeah, and one of the things she was into was snakes. Oh, we know about mythor mythodotism, mythodotism. Right. Uh, that king who would poison himself slowly over time to build an immunity. Well, she was into that. And there was a school in Alexandria and the term is iology. Iological studies is about toxicology of snakes and reptiles and animals. And they had a toxicology school. That's so wild. In Alexandria before they got burned part of it. Um, uh, and she was into that. And she was doing experiments. And myth that says that she was doing experiments on prisoners with her different snakes. And this Creepy. deals with it's her. <laughs> well, it deals with her death. Because you got to know, she, was, she died at a young age. And she was sought after by different um, emperors and kings and pharaohs. And they all wanted to get with her. And, yeah, she's kind of a Helen figure, right? It's unfortunate. Yeah. And her family didn't get along, and everyone's killing each other and poisoning each other. And finally, they're coming to get her. And she just gets, she's a powerful woman running the, one of the world's most ancient spots. She did nothing wrong other than powerful men coming to take shit over. Right. And so she said she went out on her own terms. And they say that she died by snake. And apparently what all that research was, she wanted to know how to, how to have, which one would give you a peaceful death. Cause not all snakes react the same. 
a Cobra bite compared to the Viper bite is a different, it might affect the respiratory, the acetylcholine. Um, it affects different parts of the body, different snakes, let's say. I mean, they, they all fuck you up, but it's how it reacts on you. Right. So peacefully put you to sleep and just, you could die. And so that's what she wanted was a compound. She wanted to know how to just, she's like, because, you know, in ancient times, if they were to find you, they'd take you back to Rome and parade you. Like we were talking about uh, Zenobia before, the, you know, the they'll take you back to, to Rome and parade you in the streets and whip you and beat you. Yeah, I know. And you get raped and be destroyed, utterly destroyed, almost certainly, you know? Nah, she went out on her own terms. And the way she did it was ritualistic in that it's the queen's death. She's not dying at death. She's been reborn through the serpent. It's the snake mother doing what the snake mother would do anyways. Amazing. I love that. So it's just, was hastened. <laughs> it was only just hastened by other people's political ambitions. That's all. Right. You know, and there was, like I said, a school there. It was famous for it. And you, that's why people talk about uh, her famous uh, aspic, Cleopatra's aspic, because they had th those are snakes as well. Um, so many different kinds, the asps, you know, the famous Egyptian ones. But yeah, let's, let's hit the next picture. So exploring the snake mother motif. Ancient Egypt. Watch it. Cleopatra. Uh, Cyprus. Because some of them, they, they had to go to hide at Cyprus. A lot of times some of the royal families hid at Cyprus. I think even the Ptolemies had to, to go and hide there. Where she comes from. The Ptolemic uh, dynasty. And the other island next to that over there, where you'll have a lot of snake action going on, is Crete. Right. Minoan. And that here's the here's the Minoan snake mother. You might have seen that motif. I'm pretty sure people have seen the one on the right. Yeah, this is one of the most famous um symbols of ancient Greece, you know, the Minoan snake mother goddess. Right. And like you'll often see these uh like we had uh, Dr. Tully on in in who is a who is an expert on the, the ancient Minoa, and she believes that these were priestesses who would engage in a form of possession where they would draw down these entities into themselves. And it was connected to this tree worship and um, these fairies that they would see, you know, and then she thought they were doing these ecstatic body trances. Like she, she actually references the same doctor I've talked about several times on this show, uh, Felicity, uh, Felicitas Goodman in her work on ecstatic body postures. And she believed that that's what this is here, you know? And uh, you'll often see them, these priestesses enshrined in these like um, seated, like queen seats. And they'll have this, the, the chairs will have the snakes or they'll have the bulls or the labrys. And often they'll be contained holding the snakes, you know? And on her head there is a cat, right? You can't really tell, but yeah. <laughs> You're familiar. And we know the relationship between cats and snakes. Um, it's it's like the mongoose. You, you, right. you, you, your pets hate each other, but they're like both. You're both your pets. Like you have you have a snake and a mongoose. Your two favorite pets. Here we have a cat and a snake. Your two favorite pets. Right. You, know, you, you use one to catch the other. Right. <laughs> right. 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 You know and. I know Bacchus gets tied up in this eventually too. Well, a big thing that's of, of huge discovery was if we look at the linear, uh, there's linear A and linear B, not the oldest one, but the one that's slightly newer. They've gone through it and Dionysus is referenced, right? This is some of the oldest Greek there is. And we, we were still seeing references to Dionysus. You know, so he's clearly connected to this and as well as Hercules, right? Like it, Hercules is a lot of his labors are said to happen in Crete. And there's there's a lot going on there. It's, a, it's really interesting, you know, um, and Manoa, like we now think like a lot of those those palaces, they aren't palaces in the sense of like one king or one queen. They believe that these were giant communal households 
that were were like dozens of families, maybe hundreds of families lived together, you know, and it and they also believe that that society was most likely matriarchal. Really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you know, and they found altars, snake altars. Right. And there's a story where Bacchus. Uh, uh, are we going to say rape, or are we going to say he seduces Arya? How do you say her name? Ar Ariadne. 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 And that could be Ariadne, a representation of her right there in some myths. And Bacchus is coming along and sees her, and he's like, hey! And because of that, takes her crown, throws it in the sky, and it becomes a constellation. Yeah. Um, wow. And Bacchus is part of the snake worship there in Rome. Because Bacchus is big in Rome, because it goes from like Egypt to Greece, and then Rome eventually puts it all together. And let's go well, to the next these, picture. We see these psychopomp, dying and rising god figures that are associated with the wilderness and associated with wine. And the earliest one we have is Osiris. Then we have Dionysus Bacchus. In India, we have Shiva. Right. And then there are many other examples, but this is such a primordial image of this wild drug man, you know, yeah, who dies yeah. and rises, who's both a god and a man. Right. Very interesting. And always associated with the snakes, too, not just the wines, but the snakes. And her, associated with her, the mother goddess. So eventually in Rome, they started setting up these different altars. Um, there's different terms from Laria, Lares, Laura, mm -hmm. um, and their household altars. And they would a lot of times have snakes, and they deal with Bacchus and snakes. And and snakes would be wrapping around the altar. And that's a, a concurrent theme. This is this theme has been going on since Moses put the snake on the staff. Since uh, the crimson worm on the cross, there's uh, Asclepius. Since Wadget has her, her her cobra serpent on her staff, Hermes with the the, the caduceus, right? Shiva with his uh, with his serpent in his hair, you know, um, or his belt, right? Like it's constant, 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 and you and you see it everywhere. And I'm I'm sure like we're less familiar with the Chinese, but I'm sure you see it in the Chinese. I know that we see it with the what is it, Mami Wati in the African, right? Like uh, there's so much with the snake going on, and always these snake altars, right? And usually somehow connected to a phallus as well. Right. And that phallus could be the jet pillar, that could be a maypole, that could be a, a the solar Shiv, a shivling or, or yeah. lingam, shivalinga, a sundial, a threshing floor pole. That right. could be the Garden of Eden tree, the tree of life. Because wherever pool. you go, the snake's going to find it and wrap around it. Or that could be that tree in uh, Asperities. Right. You know, the... the and it relates the to the apples. cosmic symbol, right, of, that, of, the, of, the, of the Orphic egg, right, where you see the snake wrapped around the egg, right, where yep. the egg is symbolic of that womb, right, the cosmic nix, that timelessness the chaos out of which life comes. And then the snake is representative of time, that dividing force, that, that power, right? And again, this goes back to that, we were talking about that masculine and that feminine, right? These, these are the primordial creative forces, you know? It's just in the ancient pagan mindset, the feminine was primordial. She was the dark womb out of which everything came. And... The sun, the light, the father worships the dark, right? As much as he's a terrified of her. And she's always an active, creative force, not this passive, dismissive force that we get later on, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So let's hit the next pick. And this is in Turkey, and this is one of these altars, one of these snake pillars. Wow. And then they would do stuff on top of the, the pillar. And I threw that in there because we'll we'll end up going back here at the end of the episode to Turkey, you know, because we talk about Turkey a lot, Ephesus and Sano Uruk, and there's so much weird stuff going on there. Gobekli Tepe, 
You have well, some of the oldest civilizations that we know of, right? Like the oldest settlements of humanity, right? In terms of like structures, like of, of, of that we have found, are in Turkey. It's just it's just the reality, you know. Right, right. So hit, let's hit the next picture. Now we're going to jump on up above Turkey, and that's where we got a group of Amazon warrior women that play around with bows and arrows and snakes. And if one of these uh, arrows hits you, you die within an hour. You turn to stone, it said, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it says the modern terms toxic and toxin derived from the ancient Greek word for bow, tox toxon, from old Persian toxa, an arrow. So your wow. toxins and your, your kills from a bow and arrow. You know, we've even heard that there's a mythology of Jesus holding a bow. I heard that in the past couple of days. <laughs> yeah, you see this. It's there's a bunch of this really interesting imagery that I've seen coming out of like um, Europe right after it's been Christianized. So, like you know, around the time of Charlemagne, where you'll see Jesus with a bow and arrow, or Jesus with the spear. They'll even call him Jesus the spear thrower. And I'm like, what is going on? This seems so um, pagan, you know? <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, so toxins are from a bow. It's, these are called uh, arrow poisons. And medicine comes out of arrow poisons. Or the other way around. Either way, these compounds work with the human body and with the animals. So let's hit the next picture. Because we're talking about these Amazon warriors now. And when I say Amazon, I'm not talking about South America. I'm talking about these warrior women, Scythian. These uh, horse riding nomadic women, which would be modern day Armenia, Georgia, um, Crimea. Crimea. And there are several different tribes, like the Greeks kind of, they use the broad terms Amazonian and Scythian. But they're really f referring to many different cultural groups of a similar heritage. The key to this heritage being that they had these strong female-centered leadership, and that they were they were doing they were, they were they had a similar form of dress, usually involving these red robes, right? And like you said, the the uh, cauterizing of one of the breasts, and also these these women who would dress as men. Like we've even found. Some of these Amazonian women who were buried with fake beards, you know, who were who were addressed by male names, and like until you you start to look, you don't you don't recognize them as women, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, very powerful. And the reason they would cauterize one breast is to aid in their shooting of the arrow. Wild, yeah. You know? This is this is such an incredible thing for these people would ride on horseback and they could fire an arrow from behind themselves, right? This put them at such a technological advantage compared to the everyone else. And they had magic arrows with 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 poison, right? Well, and you know what's called <laughs> Scythicon. This uh, and you know how they made it? They dig a hole in the ground and put like a dead human or dead animal decomposing along with some of those snakes and their venom and bury it and come back and dig it up and dip their, dip their arrows in it. Wild. And that one would take you out in an hour and there was no cure for it. That's like, terrifying. <laughs> and they, they would make crazy sounds and they took hallucinogenics. They had different types of drinks. We've heard of Homa and Soma was part of the right. rule. Um, These were ephedra so we drinks. go into the different things they take. Yeah, right. Like the ephedra type drinks, right? These would cause you to become really aggressive and 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 boost you with a ton of energy, right? And we also know that they were doing. Remember when we were talking with Wretch and he was sh showing us all of those hot boxing rituals? The Scythians were notorious for cannabis, cannabis oh, yeah. and everything, right? <laughs> and that's what the cradle of winemaking there as well. Because that part of the world is a cradle. This is where they're fighting right now. This is where the this is what Putin wants this little strip of land here. They've been fighting for this since ancient times. This this is where a lot of stuff is taking place. And people think like uh, the Noah's Ark landed there, or 
or after there, if there was a big flood on the planet that let's say it, a civilization did emerge out of that region right there right. either way there's a lot of history going on right there of different cultures fighting and battling out and the relationship with the horse at different hallucinogens and they also we talked about in other episodes they had the Eri, Nara, which were the trans priestesses right and and they would take the pregnant horse urine pregnant mare urine which they use in modern times for yeah. for women and for trans and they were taking that they're taking fermented horses milk there you know the horse has a lot to do with it and i found another thing that i'd like to share of because we talk about file transformation about let's say like the horse because you know horses feed off hay We've talked about horses in a lot of the episodes, their hoof, the ergot behind the hoof, the chestnut, um, ergotism with horses, getting it from their feet, from the threshing floor, or from eating it. The ergotair, the secret thieves language. Yeah, and if, then if you were to take that urine or milk, um, some of it, it could have up to 20% of ergotamine in it, which is, uh, if you know what ergot is, it's the clavicept for Berea. It's, it's like LSD, basically. Um, oh. But there's something else going on with the relationship with the horse and the snake. Oh? Yeah. All right. So we're, we're assuming that that archer is using a deadly arrow poison. And they've built an immunity to it, huh? Mm -hmm. That's what they're, they're, we're told. Now, what about the horse? It's going to be in contact with his snakes and with his poison and in battle and other poison arrows. And what if this stuff spills on him? Right. Or what, what's the relationship with that? Well, it turns out that's even in modern times, like they're doing with the snake venoms and turn it into cures for cancer. This is how, what was it? Louis Pasteur was doing this. This is at the 1800s. But this goes back to them. What happens is that you slowly inoculate the horse with snake venom. And after 18 months, it builds up antibodies faster than other animals, mind you. And then what they do is they bleed the horse. Let's go to the next picture. And we know that the Scythians, even Mongolians, are doing the horse bleeding and they're living off the blood and the mare's milk. Like, this is like a common no, thing that they're doing. More to it. Oh, there's Medea right there. Yeah, skip, go one more. All right. Right there. That's representation of what's called horse bleeding. And they're doing what you're talking about, collecting the blood. Well, because they first fed the horse rattlesnake venom, and over the course of 18 months, it builds up antibodies. Then you bleed it, take that, boil, coagulate, concentrate, and now you have your immunity to that snake venom. That's so wild. <laughs> And mind you, this is the culture that's drinking their urine to get estrogen and drinking their fermented milks to get hot. Wow. They know how to play with the horsey. We're talking yeah. about horses a lot in our episodes. We're trying to tell you about these horses. If you want it, the, the mystery is in your animals, your right. husbandry, and theogenic husbandry. And you like know. what's so wild about this is like, like with the cow, I've I've already said this. Like these these people are so dependent upon these animals. Even it, they, they would come across this naturally. If the if this horse is going to develop an antibody to um to snake bites, they're going to be drinking the blood anyway, right? Because like th they don't kill the the animals for meat until they're old, right? They they mostly bleed them on a regular, and it, that's a way that they can use them as like a food source and it's a sustainable food source well and, the, and they could traverse large uh, uh distances because it'd be four horses to one rider right and so he'd be riding the horse and then after that one's tired he'd go back to the other horse and boom 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 keep going and go to the other horse to pop it take a little drink get your little little sip of the red fluid and boom 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 get back out of the road and it's also wild because we know that they're mostly using the mares. And this was another tactic that was like devastating militarily because most other peoples were using the male horses because they tend to grow a few hands larger. 
but male horses generally submit to the female horses in a pack and often they would these male battle horses would panic at the sight of these mares especially if these mares are in heat you know mm. and mm. so like this was another way that they were just decimating their opponents it's, an, oh, it's yeah. really impressive so let's hit the next picture oh here we go so we're talking about drinking snakes and snake venoms and here we go this is the famous uh, snake wine and the way they make this one is just they just ferment the whole thing that's so creepy <laughs> yeah and people talk about um the venom like if you're drinking um if as long as you got no sores and in inside of your mouth for the blood and it goes through the digestive like they, they got a whole thing with this and oh, wow. so that's just fermenting it whole into an alcoholic substance and that's snake wine we'll go to the next picture and what we're, that's different than snake blood so snake wine is just fermenting the whole snake itself and then in some cases it's the the venom is being fermented or changed to make it more palatable so you just don't die well in this case it's the blood itself and so you're taking the blood not the venom question is his venom in the blood i don't know is that there... a little different so you got to know venom with snakes they have to it they have to reproduce it it's not always just there see mm -hmm. like with, with with um people say that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous you've heard that like oh the baby rattlesnake if you get bit you'll die faster well it's not that its venom is more powerful it's that it can't control its venom see a rattlesnake's venom is for honey it ain't trying to bite your ass it ain't gonna eat you anyways and so a, an adult rattlesnake can know like nah don't bite him because once it bites you it's gonna have to recharge the venom and it's gonna have to wait and be, it's gonna be hungry but the baby rattlesnake is like, ah, da, 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 da. it just sees something and it attacks it and bites it and just gives you all the venom. Like, really? It'll, yeah. yeah it'll, 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 that's what kills you is that it just gives it's like, ah, it freaks out. So there's a difference between venom and there's a difference between the blood. That's so interesting. And they're, they're also turning the blood into wine then? Or what are they doing? Drink? You can ferment as well, or you can just drink it straight. I know that, the, yeah, they're drinking it straight, often mixed with the milk, which is yeah. which, so intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's hit the next pick. And you'll see this even in Africa, more so oh, with the God. cows. They still do this, right? <laughs> oh, and who's this? The beloved John. With his cup of snakes. With his cup of snakes. And the reason is the of the myth. Myth. You know, <laughs> I had to check into that. I wanted to know why. Why does they have this cup of snakes always? Because, right. you know, uh, we know his relationship to Christ is very powerful and that that's his lover. Yeah. And he's a twin. Um, and the mom yeah. even commands Jesus like, Hey, he's going to sit with you in heaven. And he has some kind of power. He can call down thunder. They're called the sons of thunder. And they give him, they have an Aramaic title. Cause wow. those Aramaic phrases in the, in the Bible are actually magical spells and they're meant to be sung and they're gods. Each word is a god. Right. Even though you could make it into a sentence of doing something, just like the word, um, like the thief in the night translated to the Septuagint, you know, in the day, like the, you'll come in like a thief in the night. Jesus will come in the thief in the night. The word for day is Hamera is, is a goddess. And Nix is the word for night is a goddess. And it's, it's like a, a Greek mythology being turned into a regular story. Right. And now it's just night and day, but those are gods. And so th that's the same with these Aramaic phrases. And so let's hit the next picture and we'll figure out why he has the cup of snakes. And before I read that, in ancient times, so it's an apocrypha. It's one of the apocryphas of John. And it says that uh, the beloved John goes to turkey and we've talked about this in other episodes and destroys the temple of artemis right and if at, at, at ephesus which yeah, is so yeah. wild to me because like john the beloved if we're going based on the greek mythology 
is an Artemis figure, okay? Right. He, he is the feminine twin, right? His brother is the more masculine one. He's right. the lover of Jesus, right? And And it's all this weird kind of like, are they lovers? Are they not? Like, that's Artemis to a T to me, you know? Right. So, you know, in the background there, you see that pole. That could be that snake pillar conveniently there right. in the painting. And that's from the Temple of Ephesus that's been broken, that's been torn down because John incited a riot to tear it all down. And here the king comes to him and tells him, hey, what are you doing? Like, you're getting making everyone crazy. And he goes, I don't believe in your, your fake magic. And he goes, you have to prove it. And he goes, I'm going to give you a cup to drink that has snake venom. And if you, if you drink this and you're still living, then I'll convert to your God. And so you can see the two other guys in the background, they drink it first and they die. And then what happens is he either he drinks it and it doesn't die or he does a magical incarnation and incantation and the snakes fly out of the cup. And that's why you'll get all those pictures of him because he drinks the snake poison. And it's almost like how Paul has to do that snake poison right. you know, with, the, with the snakes. And so here is a little... Uh, phrase you know if you want to read that i'll have you read it it's mark 10 38 all right it says but he said to them you do not have knowledge of what you ask are you able to drink the costs which i drink or to undergo my tevila and they said to him we are able and he said to them the costs which i drink you shall drink and you shall have the tevila in which i am submerged Ooh. I'll unpack that a little bit for you what had just previously happened is that they had said, hey, Rebbe, and this is from the Orthodox Jewish Bible. It's a, you can do so many different versions. You get King James, whichever one you want to look at. This one I picked for a certain reason. So they tell him, Rebbe, we want to sit at your side in heaven. And the other disciples get mad that the twins, our beloved John, has this relationship with Jesus. It says it. Yeah, from Mary Salome. He gets yeah. to sit on the right and his brother's on the left. Right. And he tells him, we want to sit there. And that's what we command of you. And he goes, all right. You know, he goes, but do you have knowledge of what you're asking? You're going to have to drink the same cause. And that's the word it used. Well, cause can mean a cup or it can mean a potion in the Hebrew. Interesting. And it says, and, and, and will you undergo my tevila? That is a um, baptism, but a full body water baptism. Not an anointing, but a full body water baptism. And that's because Ooh. the cup and the baptism go together a lot of times. The, remember the communion and right. baptism happens a lot of times at the same time. And we know you that know? the early Baptists, right? It, this is not the modern baptism of just like dousing someone for like 30 seconds. This is like attempting to drown you and then bring you back to life type baptism. Let's be clear yeah. here. Right. <laughs> so, and so he tells them. He says, you will drink from the cup that I will drink from. He tells him, you're going you're gonna to do it. Okay, then you're going to drink from that cup. And let's go to the next picture. Well, after that, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is visited, it says, by an angel. And he's suffering. And he tells the angel, Abba, which is the Aramaic for father, which is the God, though. You know, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. He doesn't want to drink the cup. He doesn't want to drink the cup. Wow. And he had just told the beloved John, are you willing to drink the same cup that I'm going to drink? Well, what cup did the beloved John end up drinking? What was in it? Snakes, it's, right? It has snakes in it, yeah. It, it, it has snake venom. It's already telling you, you know, because it's the same cup. Jesus said, you're going to drink from the same cup, and he did. It was a snake venom cup. And here he's telling him, like, nah, I didn't want to drink that cup because he knows it's going to happen. Because it's right after this, he gets arrested with the naked boy in the garden right. wearing a medicated wrap. It, they may have done <laughs> circumcision because... Uh, the boy had to be taught the mysteries all night if it's that boy. If not, either way, the boy was naked with the medicated wrap that they do use with snakes. Um, 
and why would there be snakes at the Garden of Gethsemane? Because that's where the snakes hang out in the olive trees and the olive groves. That's one of their favorite places. Because of the way the, the olive trees have like holes and nooks and crevices and they can just squiggle around. And and it had a mikveh there for the full body submersion. And it had it meant oil press, because you had to press the oil because they mixed the the oils was part of the antidote for the anointing oils. That's how they would put it into your body. Because they're making cuts in the body and because you didn't have syringes. How are you going to take things back in the ancient time? You had, either needed alabastron to cheek it, you had to drink it in some wines or beers or concoctions, or you had to put it through slits, cuts in the body to get into the bloodstream. Right. Or even the yeah. eyes, the mucus in the eyes. Ammon talked about that with the with the Paul saying that he was he has the that snake venom thing in order to ingest poisons. Um and then yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's something that we see all the time, right? But and you know, Paul, before he goes to the island and has that snake um incident, sees Lydia, who's the woman who's the vendor of purple. And so she's she's and he sees her down by the water. And down by the waters where you get the mollusks to make purple. And we know that purple deals with these compounds, with the mystery right. So there's different elements that we know are in this compound. We just don't know exactly how they're using everything. You know, it's anointing oils. We know the olive oils in it, body fluids, animal ejaculates, milks, urines, bloods. Right. No, we know like the they ancients know. are doing all the drugs all the time. And the drugs are an essential part of these e internal experiences of, of discovery, right? <laughs> it's just yeah. it's what. And we know after this, after uh, he's arrested and they put the robes on him, purple robes, and take him. And on the cross, he says some Aramaic phrases, magical phrases. And it seems like he's suffering from snake bite poisoning. Those are the symptoms. He's thirsty. Um, they, they, it's not a normal crucifixion. And when they say that they dip a high sop in vinegar, gall, to give him to drink, that's a snake bite remedy. So is it that's a joke? Me. Is is it just is it just talent? It's like the writers of the Bible like still wanted to tell you something. Is it like Mickey Mouse? The old Mickey Mouse, you know, cartoons from the 60s and 50s where there's things hidden in the back? Is it just the I, writers of the Bible just like, nah, we just have to tell them. Like, <laughs> I just think about it this way, right? Like, it's very clear that Jesus is coming out of a mystery type cult, a type area, you know, a type group. He's using the mystery language. He's invoking the mystery symbolism. Every other Greek mystery, um, Egyptian mystery, Mesopotamian mystery we have is a coded text referring to drugs. Every single one. Why would the Bible be any different? Right, right. Hey, let's hit the next picture. <laughs> we'll, we'll wrap it up with one or two more picks. Oh, one more, hit one more. Right. That's throwing you in a little quickie right there. Boom. That's uh, the Caravaggio painting, the famous one with Saint Anne, Madonna, and the child. And that's uh, Jesus' grandma. And there they're stepping on the serpent. The left uh -huh. foot always. It's always your left foot that's doing it. If you look at the pharaonic statues and, st and certain statues, that left foot forward has certain esoteric connotations. And here we have the snake, as well as the red dye, the mollusks or kermes or acacia. Um, remember, the colors of these dyes are psychoactive. But the painting is very telling about Jesus' relationship already with that snake. With the snake venoms. It's pre-configured. And Anne's just in there tripping out. And you know Anne, which they say is the mother of uh, Mary, had two other daughters, which were both named Mary as well. That's supposed to be also the mother of Mary Salome. Oh, that's, really? That's what they say in the infancy gospel of James. And the thing that's weird that later on the church bans this information, but it's in the older uh, text, is that her daughters were, or her kids were from three different men, three different husbands. So Saint Anne, the kids are from three different husbands. 
And so they didn't like that in tradition. At a certain point, they're like, we got it. No, nah, we can't be having that. That's too wanton. And it's because she was a powerful mm -hmm. woman. It's one of those matriarchal things. They have to write out the matriarchal nuances of the story. You know, the snakes and these, these ancient mothers, the snake mothers. So let's hit one more picture. We'll wrap it up. Boom. Back to Turkey. They found this statue of Aphrodite with snakes. In a pot. Right there. Some magic. What is that? Wine. Some magic snake wine. It's wild. You know? And so this is Aphrodite with snakes on the on the on the left, like I said, the left side. That left foot forward or her knee is tilted. And this is Aphrodite associated with uh, the snakes in Asclepion, Asclepius, the Asclepion there in Turkey. And the healing power or the venom of the snake with Aphrodite. That's amazing. Wow. And, and we, we consider Aphrodite to be Mary Aphrodite Urania, you know, the Virgin Mary and Aphrodite and uh, Uranus, you know, and you have Jove and Jupiter and Set and Saturn and they're all there, all the players. But yeah. So the snake mother. Yeah, she's at the heart of all of this, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So like and subscribe, comments. Uh, wild. You know, we appreciate you watching. Um, tomorrow, join us Sunday. Tomorrow, with a uh, can have Lady Babylon, Doctor Almond might be there. Uh, Gunk Wrench, maybe Neil from Gnostic Informant, and we'll be unpacking more of the Snake Mother. But they're going to get deep. Well, yeah, we plan to get really, really, really deep because you know, Ammon is an expert on Medea, and Medea is one of these snake mother figures, right? She also oh, cool. is the is the founder of the oldest form of the Greek mystery, you know. So this is going to get incredible, you know. Awesome. We're going to have such a fun time. So, yeah, this has been our presentation on the snake mother, and as we've seen, right, like from the most primordial times through ancient Egypt across the uh, Arabic world in Anatolia, you know, she's just so central to all of these mysteries. And uh, yeah, make sure you guys come out tomorrow. And uh, any last words, uh, Dion? Stay blessed. Keep your heads up. Stay blessed. All right, everyone. Peace and love and hail Satan. <laughs>